Greetings from Osaka and it looks gorgeous out there but it's actually very very hot, uh, too hot to go out, too humid. Uh, so I'm at home with my books and I wanted to do a little books vlog because I was watching other people's, young people's mostly, books vlogs on YouTube uh, today and thinking how different their culture is from mine, how different the books look from the books I have here in my apartment. So let's just um, do a little vlog about what I've got around me here. Yeah, here's a little, another little shelf corner. Um, these are just the books I have here in Japan, of course. I have a lot of books in, uh, in storage in Berlin. So this is uh, the kind of stuff that I buy in the, the second-hand shops here in Osaka, in English. Mostly in English, although it's a, a lot of it's very German. This is Jakob Wassermann's Kasper Hauser novel, which I started reading last night, actually. And had to stop because I had bleary eyes. Another problem with being old. Bleary eyes, singular. Yeah, for some reason, I always had this. This, I always imagined that somebody died. Some expat died in Osaka and left all these books. And that, the same thing will happen to me in turn. I'll leave these weird, mysterious books, which are very obviously one man's taste, and somebody will buy them. Some other lonely, miserable expat in Osaka in a few decades will buy them and think, I wonder who left these to the bookstore. So these are some Faber poetry books which come from the 80s when I was buying buying these new, uh, not by the same authors, but it's a series. I like, you know, I do like genres in my own way. I like series which have a strong visual identity and this is a kind of 80s Faber series where they, they went back to almost the Penguin style of the, the 30s and 40s when there was a kind of generic series cover a lot of these are by Susan Winks. Stephen Spender, obviously, from the Auden Spender left wing kind of uh, 1930s stuff. Um, later, Spender doesn't really do much for me. I, I'm a big fan of Auden. Here, talking of the radical 60s counterculture, Eric Fromm was a huge influence on me when I was a student, and I just thought, I wonder how that's going to read if I look at Eric Fromm again. So here we have Escape from Freedom. Freedom can be frightening, totalitarianism. Totalitarianism can be tempting. This classic book explains why. So it does seem to me that we're living in an age which is flirting once again with totalitarianism in the form of uh, Donald Trump, for instance, or other politicians, Marine Le Pen in France. So here in the back, if a man cannot live with freedom, he will probably turn to fascism. This concise statement reflects the central idea of escape from freedom, Eric Fromm's most famous and very likely his most important book. So these people who are vaguely associated with the Frankfurt School, Eric Fromm comes from a kind of combination of psychoanalysis and the uh, radical bourgeois Eurocommunism of the Frankfurt School. So they're refusing Marx and Freud, basically. And uh, there's this idea of um, there being a psychological basis for fascism is very important for them. So you get uh, the authoritarian personality by Theodore Adorno, you get... Um, Reich's theories about... Um, look at these amazing bookmarks that you find in second-hand Japanese books, even foreign books. You get these beautiful Grecian bookmarks and things. That's for an exhibition, a ticket for an exhibition, 150 yen, and ancient Greece. This is really part of the appeal of this kind of book. Anyway, so I haven't read this yet. The, the rise of democracy set some men free politically, while at the same time giving birth to a society in which the individual feels alienated and dehumanized. Very sort of 1950s uh, ideas. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this was published in the 50s. Uh, copyright, 1941. Well, even earlier. Okay, so during the Second World War, he was writing this. Um, it's... Um, Michel Leris, very important for me with uh, his book L'Age d'Homme. Michel Leris, uh, um, part of the Acephal group. And um, of course, I also love the look and feel and smell, even the smell of these secondhand books, these musty old books, most of which I get from a, an old lady in number. But uh, yeah, he wrote, he wrote a book called L'Age d'Homme. He was sort of fusing surrealism and anthropology in a really interesting way. Sorry, the strap is uh, intruding into the picture. Um, most of my culture here, that's a hard desk, most of my culture here is either, well, it's things like Shakespeare, and so it's sort of a nostalgia for my university days, you could say. 
Uh, and I, I, I have a lot of respect for Shakespeare. I like Shakespeare's cosmopolitanism. He would definitely have been a Remainer. Uh, he would have wanted to stay in the European Union so he could have got easy access to all the, the Italian humanist stuff he was ripping off in his plays. This is Chateaubriand, Atala. Um, I didn't know anything about Chateaubriand. I love this series. This is another series, the Nouveau Classique La Rousse, which I like very much. I can read French pretty well. This has pictures in it too, though. Les mots de la nature, arbre uh, fruitier. Um, and here's, here's some other fantastic bookmarks from exhibitions. Uh, beautiful Japanese exhibitions. So people trying to improve their minds. Here's a receipt. This, this ephemera that is inside the books is almost as exciting as the book itself. Tobu Information, the Tobu Railways Romance Car in Memory of Your Trip. Um, a 1,000 yen ticket um, for a railway. Uh, this looks like the, the Tobu Hotel. Wow, Shibuya. I've stayed in. That was the first hotel I stayed in when I came to Japan. The Tobu Hotel, Shibuya. Um, beautiful printed ephemera. Almost as beautiful as the printed um, the labels and the uh, inserts in my new compilation, which I'm not advertising at all when I tell you it's called Pubic Intellectual. It was released on Friday, and it's uh, getting amazing notices. Here's Chateaubriand. What a pretty and slightly effete young man he was. Um, so I, I like reading about these people. I, I like the idea of the classics and um, sort of neglected uh, classic classical writers. Diderot. I'm a big fan of Diderot. He was... Um, the famous French encyclopédiste. He uh, compiled the encyclopedia, largely single-handed, a bit like Samuel Johnson with his dictionary. And um, But also he wrote erotic novels like Les Bijoux Indiscrets, uh, Indiscret, uh, which bijou is um, jewels, but also means a woman's sex, and it's about talking, literally talking, vaginas. So long, many centuries before the vagina monologues, um, Diderot wrote that. As a comic and but also um, very uh, entertaining sideline to his uh, more more academic stuff, and here's another Shakespeare play. This this series of the Penguin Shakespeare, I associate it with my parents' um, generation. They went to university in the fifties and they studied Shakespeare this way. So our house was full of these things. In many cases, I'm replacing books which I had as a uh, which I was brought up with in the family home. So it's very much um, a question of. Um, cultural capital uh, being almost inherited uh, and, and of course being deeply unfair. Oh, here's a slightly more modern, I mean, to me this is modern, but compared with all the stuff in the book vlogs I was looking at today, this is ancient history, the Shakespeare, Peng Penguin, new, new Penguin Shakespeare from, I guess, the 70s, beautiful Helvetica, 77, so just about the time I was going to university, um, and I like, I like the look of this classic, simple, you know, there's no embossing here. There's, uh, there's no sort of stupid handwritten uh, lettering or all the cliches of modern book design, which I, I simply can't stand. Um, Edwin Muir, Selected Poems. Edwin Muir, um, it's a Faber, and it's a, it's a 60s, early 60s Faber, I would guess. Um, he uh, was the translator, Scottish translator of Franz Kafka for the English-speaking world, the first and most important. Edwin and Willa, his sister, Muir. And um, his poetry actually is a little bit high-flown and highfalutin. I have dipped into this quite a lot. Oh, he's got a poem about Hölderlin, Hölderlin's journey. And I have a song on my new album about Hölderlin. So you can see the kind of stuff I'm drawing, that there is a kind of synergy and resonance uh, between what I'm making as Mamas and uh, this this reading material. When Hölderlin started from Bordeaux, he was not mad, but lost in mind, for a time and space had fled away. With her he had to find. A time and space had fled away with her he had to find. His sweetheart, I guess, had gone. The morning bells rang over France from tower to tower. At noon I came into a maze of little hills, head high and every hill the same, a little world of emerald hills, and at their heart... Um, the faint bell tolled, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's all a little bit ancient language you see in Edwin Muir. I, I find it, the fact he was writing in the 30s or whatever, uh, he wasn't a modernist in any sense. Uh, oh, first published in this edition, 65. Um, Les Grands Sanctuaires de la Grèce Antique. This is, again, my fascination with European takes on ancient Greece. I'm kind of obsessed with that. I was just watching also recently, again, my interview with Holger Heller and, and his song, a biography of a song, Open im Eck, 
Uh, and I, I was drawn to that song because it was in German and I didn't quite understand it. And I'm really into, as we'll see a bit later in this vlog, uh, I'm really into things I don't quite understand. And things which speak of other civilizations. And um, what I liked about Holger Heller's Urban in Mech was that he'd actually sampled ancient Greek music. And um, I didn't realize that till I interviewed him. But obviously it, it resonated the strangeness of the string sounds in that, the samples of the string sounds. Here's Dante's Divine Comedy. I've had so many different copies of this. This is... Book three, Paradise. Everyone, of course, focuses on Inferno because everyone's more interested in dystopia than utopia. Um, I haven't started this, but I, again, I like the simple dignity of these old, uh, beautiful old editions. And I get these for, you know, these are 100 yen. Um, it's like uh, less than a, a dollar. Christopher Marlowe. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm into the Elizabethans very much, and I'm into, you know, revenge tragedies and things like that as well. Um, here he's translating Ovid. Uh, Ovid was pretty important, the Metamorphoses of Ovid. Um, a lot of translations in here, Hero and Leander. And another beautiful bookmark of a, a tiger, a Japanese exhibition. Looks like it was an exhibition. Um, maybe one of the museums in Osaka. So I'm not just buying these old European books, I'm also buying into the past of a, a Japanese person who was sort of a smitten with Europe from as far away as I now feel from Europe. Um, uh, Europe has a, a magical kind of shimmering quality. Thomas Nash, The Unfortunate Traveller, in other words, this was something I'd, I'd never heard of, but actually he was a, a contemporary of Shakespeare, a pamphleteer, poet, storyteller, satirist, scholar, moralist, and jester. So already with that list of um, attributes, you know, he sounds like my kind of guy. His work epitomizes everything that comes to mind when we think of the character of the Elizabethans, their shameless minglings of devoutness and bawdy, scholarship and slang, the inexhaustible fluency of their language, their strictly ad personam controversies, their occasional brutality, their relish for life, and their constant awareness awareness of the imminence of death. Nash himself wrote, I have written in all sorts of humours more than any young man of my age in England. He died in his early 30s. So this is um, a collection of his stuff and, and it looks really fascinating. I have dipped into it but I haven't read enough yet to tell you much. This is an Aldous Huxley uh, novel of course um, about, it's set in California. It's about a, a strange um, tycoon uh, uh, I did. I, I've read about a third of this, and I petered out a little bit. It was an interesting kind of satire, but a little arid somehow. Um, Samuel Johnson, the complete English poems. Um, I kind of liked Samuel Johnson because of his influence on Samuel Beckett. That's a weird way into Johnson, but uh, and also his Latinism. You know, the fact he was such a classicist. I'm I into the classics. Andre Gide, uh, Fruits of the Earth. I haven't read this yet. Uh, Gide. Influenced me quite a bit. Um, oh, here's a book by a, fr by a friend, Ian Stephen. Mackerel and Cremola, Stories and Recipes. Ian must have given me this when I interviewed him in, I think, 2012. Um, and, of course, since then he's published his first major novel, uh, the book of Fish and Death, I think it's called. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, uh, sort of magical, the author of The Little Prince. Um, these are short stories by him. I love anything with a Powell Clay cover in, in a 1970s Penguin edition, and I love Saint-Exupéry. Um, I haven't read all of this. In fact, have I even started? I don't think I've even started this. I should read more um, before I go to sleep. This is Bruno, Bruno Bettelheim, Psychanalyse des Contes. The, the Conte de Fée, uh, Conte de Fée are fairy tales, and it's the psychoanalysis of fairy tales. And again, as in the Elizabethan stuff, it's that unlikely mixture that really appeals to me of uh, of um, the really strong and concise narrative form of a fairy tale with psychoanalysis, which is this rambling, um, a rambling reading style, which is based on the idea that things are not as they seem, and that there's always a second story behind the. Uh, the first story, and that that is a, a, essentially a very interesting premise. It might be rubbish, it might be based on nothing at all, but it's um, I think it's a great start. It's a bit like, you know, when you write a song and then you make a pop video which has a different storyline, it has a different storyboard from the song itself, and you put them together and you make a kind of third dimension by putting these two contrasting things together. Um, let's now look at uh, some of the things on the shelves, because this was specifically what was requested by my my blog reader. Um, the shelves are kind of a mixture of books and and just junk, you know, air for my bicycle tires. These are all my un 
complimentary copies of my novels. So I'm a scribbler as well as a seer, and um, that was my un-American novel, which is doing very well in France. Here's the Book of Japan's, still in its plastic wrapping. Things are conspicuous in their absence. Here's a, a ball of red twine, which I mostly use in selfies or, or um, you know, for, some, for, for its visual impact. And here, some acrylic paints, which shows that I'm... Although I'm not a visual artist, I, I always wish, kind of wish I was a visual artist, but I was recently using this one. This one's got a lot less paint in it, because I was doing lettering for my album sleeve. That's the one visual thing I do, is I occasionally do my own book jackets. That's one of my book jackets. I'm quite proud of that one. I designed that. Um, not bad, if I say so myself, for, a, for an amateur. Quotation, that's a, a creative magazine which Japan produces, one of the few remaining interesting creative magazines. Some copies of the reissue of my first album, which came out, uh, I guess, just a few months ago, on manufactured recordings. And of course, there's lots of comps of the, of the compilation. Complimentary copies of Pubic Intellectual. Um, old Japanese art magazines. A lot of this stuff is, uh, well, these are my, my 45s. I have huge collections of uh, vinyl, but we're not talking about that. Um, the story of 4AD, Martin asked, that's um, there as a complimentary copy because I was in interviewed for that. I'm talking about uh, 4AD records. The Letters of Lewis Carroll. This is from another second-hand shop in Number, quite close to the old lady shop, um, which has a large number of books about Lewis Carroll. And uh, the Japanese in general, possibly because, some, uh, because of some of their dubious... Um, sexual tendencies. They're very interested in Lewis Carroll, who was also um, minded that way. So his letters are actually very entertaining, very interesting. This is another book from that same shop, uh, Entre TV, Les, Les Singularités de la France Antar Antarctique. Uh, I mentioned this in my Un-America book because uh, this is a reprint of a, a book from, the I think, the 16th century. And it's Antarctic France is actually their name for Brazil. So this was basically travel tales from Brazil. Uh, the French have always had a look at these creatures. These are the kind of amazing singularities, the creatures that people thought lived in Brazil, human-headed uh, animals, sort of hairy, bizarre. This is the great thing about um, not knowing is that you imagine and uh, Living far away, as I as I live far away from America, for instance, in the West, you can start to imagine alternative versions of those places and strange beasts and uh, here be here be monsters, you know. And of course, there really are monsters, so it's not that unrealistic. There are monsters like Donald Trump. Japanese Indies Music, 1976 to 89, A History and Guide. I bought this when I was um, at my friend Satoru's shop, Forever Music, and I haven't uh, taken it out and read it. It actually looks like a really great. A very interesting guide. Um, at the same time, independent labels in Japan, I don't know, there are a lot of dreadful Japanese in indie bands who sell their CDs at gigs and just play the, the generic guitar music or whatever. Here's Calvino, who's like one of my great favorite authors. Um, Adam One Afternoon. This is an early piece by him, an early work by him, which is based on Italian folk tales. Not as interesting as this later kind of speculative fiction, uh, to my mind. With my friend David Woodard and uh, um, sort of friend Christian Kracht uh, exchanging letters, a brief wäsche, a letter exchange, 2004 to 2009. That's also kind of set in South America for a large part because they went together on trips to South America. Um, question d'artiste, uh, a lot of sort of periodicals. This is an Osaka-based um, music magazine, Insects. Uh, yeah, various architecture magazines and things like that. Um, Pax Israeliana, this is based on when I was in Tel Aviv and met these people who run um, a thing called Public School, where sort of graphic design meets architecture, meets cultural critique. Um, even in War Vile Bodies, I bought this actually because it was so important to David Bowie when he was making Aladdin Sane. And uh, when I was reading the blog um, Pushing Ahead of the Dame, this came up as... Uh, 
the experimental original war. Yeah, when he was young, well, later he became an old fogey with an air trumpet, but when he was young, he was um, part of the 1920s modernism, which uh, must have been so stimulating. It must have been, I, I hark back a lot to the 60s, but in Britain, the 20s was just as radical and just as experimental, uh, possibly more so, because the 60s has its conservative side, which is that hippies were in love with bric-a-brac from the Victorian era and the romantic idea of going back to the soil and all the rest of it. The 20s was when modernism really hit and uh, suddenly you go from this Victorian thing to the, the stark lines and um, exciting artistic and cultural and sexual experiments of, uh, of the 20th century and new age, uh, post-war as the 60s was, but with a, with a vitality and a freshness which uh, um, early war does capture. Robert Lowell's Life and Works. For some reason, Robert Lowell has always been a very important uh, poet for me. Paul Claudel, L'Annonce Fait à Marie. Uh, I haven't, I've bought this, I think partly because I love this sort of onion skin wrapping on this, and um, I love uh, Claudel's, uh, I, I, I don't know about Claudel at all as a writer, actually. I, I have no idea, but I just love this. Oh, it smells great as well, so musty. I love the, the look of these Gallimard books. Um... The dream is Gilbert Adair. There are things you buy. It's a bit like being in a in a lodge on holiday, and you just read whatever's to hand because it's there. Um, when you're in a, a foreign country like Japan, you know you reach for whatever books you <coughs> you can find, and you get things you wouldn't otherwise normally get. This is Brian Dillon's novel Sanctuary, which I have free copies of because I interviewed him. Uh, we interviewed each other. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of running out of things. Denton Welsh journals. This is a print on demands. Faber finds uh, this is great. No, Denton Welsh, one of my favourite um, English novelists from the mid 20th century. Gay, orchid. No, actually, no, not not orchid lover. I'm, I'm getting him mixed up. Uh, Denton Welsh was uh, an art student who was um, <clears throat> had a terrible cycling accident, and uh, wrote heartbreakingly sensitive and beautifully written um, autobiographical works. Um, Literary Essays of Ezra Pound. This is a book we had on the family bookshelves uh, when I was growing up, and it's a fantastic book. Um, it's, uh, it's influenced my current album quite a bit. I realized reading this, I was reading this on trains in Europe uh, when I was on my... I had a train pass in May and went all around Europe, and um, I realized that Ezra Pound was the archetypal hipster. Again, we're going back to the 20s, and we're going back to a certain sensibility of... You know, Ezra Pound famously said, make it new. That was his advice to artists and writers of all kinds. And, of course, like Wyndham Lewis, he had some dubious political alliances later on, especially in Italy. But um, he, he really, there's a hipster snobism in Ezra Pound and a kind of a wise-ass, um, but super educated and super enthusiastic side to him where he would, he's into the troubadours and he's into... Um, the Elizabethans, and, you know, he knows what he likes and he knows why he likes it, and he states it like a great critic. He's a great critic. and So the word pillywink comes up in one of these. He's describing, um, oh, I think it's uh, Augustus John or something he's talking about, and he, he uses this word, he says it's um, pillywink on a mandolin or something. And uh, pillywink turns out to have been a thumbscrew used in... Um, um, the Middle Ages in London. Pillywink and Thumbikin is another one. So I, these words turn up in um, the first song I wrote for the, the new album, um, Scobberlotches. Originally that was going to be called Pillywink because of Ezra Pound. So, yeah, a hipster. It, it, it had never occurred to me. I always thought, oh, well, your Pound was a, he was a great poet, but he was a fascist. But now I realize basically he's a sort of hipster. Uh, and his influence on T.S. Eliot was, it's a bit like uh, the influence on Bob Dylan of um, Allen Ginsberg or something like that. You know, someone who's a bit further out and a bit further, deeper into the, the things which uh, are cool at, in the given era. Um, Malcolm Lowry was also super important over this summer. I was reading this, I, I picked this up in a, a bookshop in Munich uh, this is um, Luna Caustic, which is an account of his alcoholism, and Here is Our Lord from Heaven, Thy Dwelling Place, which is a very interesting collection of short stories. I love the way he writes, um, Malcolm Lowry. I haven't read Under the Volcano, which is, of course, his famous work. Very dark, um, very drunk, drunken tales. Um, 
I've only got 10 seconds left on this card, so I'm going to um, stop here. I wanted to finish, because uh, it's, it's got quite long, but <clears throat> I wanted to talk about this little corner of my uh, apartment, which is as much visually decorative as it is um, a bookshelf of sorts, a, a sort of uh, very avant-garde bookshelf. This is an insert from, uh, these are all Surkamp, uh, mostly edition Surkamp from the 60s, and I, I love, first of all, just the colours of these, these books, mostly shades of orange, that very 60s and 70s kind of uh, colour combination, which for me is inherently optimistic and, of course, nostalgic for the time I was a kid and growing up. Here's um, a catalogue of 1972 Surkamp authors. So I, what I do, instead of reading, because I don't read German really, I, I, I understand about 45% of German. And I do enjoy not understanding, but I enjoy half understanding also. But what I do is I take out the insert and I, I Google these people. Like this guy Goma, he's still alive. Although he, there was some controversy about some racist statements he made um, about the Jews, but then he, he said, oh, my, my wife is a Jew, what are you talking about? Um, you know, you find these sort of bits of trivia. You think, which of these, obviously Beckett not still alive, but some of these, it's amazing that some Elliot dead. Oi. Um, yeah, it's, I kind of find it fascinating. Here, the top of the literary program is Uwe Johnson. Um, Hans Magnus Enzensberger, there's a kind of Thomas Bernhardt, there's a literary universe in these old uh, Surkamp books which is so alien to foreign from the kind of things that the vloggers I was watching on YouTube are talking about, it's like a different universe and uh, I, so I kind of wanted to make this a, a kind of almost satirical vlog because what really interests me, and these are, these books are talismanic for me. They're, it's not just about having the book; it's about having the particular edition from the particular era and buying into the values of that era, especially here in Japan, and having, in some cases, Japanese annotations in the margins of these. Um, you get that sense of somebody very reverently uh, um, imbibing, absorbing this material as a kind of a distant promise of a better world in some way. Here's a, a workbook on um, Tancred Dorst. Um, uh, no, this, yeah, about Tancred Dorst. So I, I spent an evening, um, this is essays, but it's a Festschrift sort of uh, deal where um, this dramatist called Tancred Dorst is being celebrated. And uh, so I spent an evening looking up, you know, uh, watching YouTube videos about Tancred Dorst and, you know, who is. Who was this guy? Uh, what was his work like? Um, three uh, actors um, play the old uh, poet. It says there. Werner Hinz in Hamburg. Uh, just th this kind of rather unknown world. I, I used to, I, when I was a student, I would go to the German literature department. I wasn't signed up, I wasn't doing German. Uh, but I would go to the shelves of the library which had the German books on them and, and find it fascinating as a an alternative universe really. Here's Hölderlin again. Oh there's a little bug. See these books are full of little bugs. I don't know if you can see that. Little book bug. I, these are not scary. They're sort of funny They're matching the colours of the books. It's sort of a yellow bug on a yellow spine. Um, Hyperion by Hölderlin. Um, Hölderlin uh, mentioned of course in uh, my new album for uh, his uh, Death of Empedocles play, which was an early work of his. Here's material on Peter Weiss's Marat Saad, which I've seen in the theatre, which is a classic radical piece of anti-theatre from the 60s. Um, Heine, Heine uh, German romantics. And this <laughs> this appeared in a photograph on my, my Tumblr recently. It just looked great with my room out of focus behind it. Uh, Goethe's Clavigo. Um, this is his, a kind of work of juvenilia of Goethe, a play he wrote about uh, the romantic affairs of an, a famous intellectual, as I recall, um, an Italian intellectual. Uh, I, I can't remember, but again, I, I, rather than reading this, uh, which is probably not very interesting to read as a play on the page, I googled who was Clavigo, what period of Goethe's life did this come from? And I like the fact that Goethe was a genius, and I feel we should read books by geniuses. I, I'm kind of old-fashioned in that sense. I don't want to read, um, you know, just the latest bestsellers or whatever. I want to to dip my mind into the work of uh, the greatest, which has been thought and felt and seen, etc., etc. These are many of these are actually 
books about other authors. Um, this is um, a political book, Mass Culture and Spontaneity, uh, towards the altered um, product forms of the mass communication in late capitalism. Farron form? Maybe pro maybe that's not product forms, but that's that looks like an interesting political book. Uh, this is a, because this is a Fremdsprachen text, so it's a foreign text in German. So it's uh, Ambrose Bierce's The Devil's Dictionary, which is fantastic. I got for two euros in Munich. Um, idiot. Definition. A member of a large and powerful tribe whose influence in human affairs has always been dominant and controlling. Now that's terribly relevant to me for the, after Brexit. The idiot's activity is not confined to any special field of thought or action, but pervades and regulates the whole. He has the last word in everything. His decision is unappealable. He sets the fashions of opinion and taste, dictates the limitations of speech, and circumscribes conduct with a deadline. Every definition in this is fantastic, and uh, that's a good place to stop, maybe. I don't know. I've just got other, I've got other reclam editions here. Um, some of them are just almost pamphlets. 30 yen. That's amazingly cheap. That's like uh, 20 pence in Britain. And I love the sparseness of the graphic design. 50 yen. Another little bug on this, though, unfortunately. But anyway, I can live in peace with these little beasties. The uh, story of the history of uh, German theatre. Reclam. Anyway, yes, so it's a kind of... It's a nostalgic throwback to me. Max Frisch I, I love a lot. That's um, a play of his... Uh, two plays of his, actually. The... The Fire Brigade, um, The Fire Raisers, rather, I think it's called. Peter Hanke, Kasper. This is another another take on Kasper. I wish I could read German better, because I would read the um, I, the other edition I've got of Kasper, and then I'd read this, which is a much more radical, avant-garde, theatrical take on the story of Kasper Hauser. Seems very central in German culture, the story of Kasper Hauser, and yet uh, he's the ultimate outsider. Tacitus, <laughs> Agricola, Latin Deutsch. So even if I don't understand the uh, German, I can... Uh, I can get it from the left-hand side page, which is all in Latin. Um, I'm going to leave it there and let the insects continue to gnaw their way through these ancient um, books.